Talking Tottenham every week, no better place to be sat. If it's a win, lose, draw, we'll be here for a chat. Best believe we tackle topics like Romero in the back. Young Min Son, what can go wrong when he's on form? It's a dream come true, so sit back, relax. Hello and welcome to another episode of Holly Hotspurs Live. We are back, ladies and gents, with a win uh, to discuss under our belts, obviously after beating Luton 2-1 at home. And with me to dissect it all and more, I am joined by three fabulous guests. So first of all, George, it's amazing to have you back on the channel. How are you, my friend? I'm very good, thank you. Happy Easter to everyone that's watching and um, happy to be on discussing Spurs. Luckily got a win, so it's all positive. All good. Indeed, indeed. And also, I'm joined by Seb as well. Seb, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Excited for my first appearance. Yeah, all good. All good. Lovely stuff. And like I say, luckily as well that we've got a win to dissect, so it's even better. And we're also joined by Simon. Simon, how are you two? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. Amazing stuff. But let's crack in into it, because obviously it was a 2-1 win. Um, but George, in true Spurs fashion, we like to leave everything till last minute to seal the deal. But what was your kind of thoughts uh, of the game in all, overall? Well, I, I think like most of us, I sort of went into the game thinking it was going to be a 4-0 thrashing that we sort of expect. But, you know, it's Spurs. Um, and it didn't happen that way, as usual. I think it, it maybe first half, it was a case of the players thought that as well. They thought they would absolutely better Luton and it just wasn't the case. I was actually very surprised by how they played. I wasn't expecting Luton to press us as much as they did, which I think maybe took the players a little bit by surprise. Um, but I think rightly so. Ange probably gave them the right sort of uh, kick up the, the backside. And also, I think the substitutions played a big part in a strong, strong second half. And I think the scoreline made it look very close, but there were some very, very simple chances that we didn't bury. And I think any other day, it could have easily have been a 4-1, 5-1 sort of game. So I um, wasn't impressed with the first half, but second half was was so much better. Definitely. And I think the thing is as well, because obviously after that battering kind of against Fulham, Seb, it was like we needed that bounce back. I'm just glad that we did manage to do it against Luton. Yeah, definitely. I was I wasn't I saw a lot of negative kind of discourse after the game that was went a bit too fast, quite similar to the Fulham game actually. I thought there was quite big overreactions to both of those games. But the second half was a lot better. I'm pleased with that. I think Ange used the squad really well. I was more impressed with the substitutions than I was against Fulham, for example. I thought the cell so had a great impact on the game, obviously Brennan Johnson as well. So, yeah, I'm overall positive about it and we needed that win going into West Ham. So it should give us some confidence going into that game, which is you know important. Mm, agreed. And that's the thing as well, Simon, because the thing going off of this game, for me, it was like it was a must win to set us up for the games coming forward. So what was your kind of overall take on, on that losing game? I mean, I think uh, my first impression, uh, or first impression, my, my impression during the game and my impression now after is a little bit different. I think I came out of that first half thinking we looked uninspired. Not bad, but I, I didn't feel like we reached the levels we can. Uh, I think we came out uh, much stronger in second period or second half. Uh, but looking at it uh, now, just looking at the stats, looking at um, uh, watching the game again, we actually played a lot better than I than I initially thought. I think we had a lot of anxiety going into the game because of how the Fulham game kind of ended. Because that was the odd one. Because we couldn't, we didn't really have anything to kind of blame. We just didn't show up. So I think we had some anxiety, and I also feel like us as a fan base kind of had this uh, unspoken demand that we wanted to see our team kind of show up and show out. Um, but like, I was really crit critical of, of Kulusevski and while he didn't have a good game, he had a couple of assists, uh, a couple of close assists. Uh, I think we should have scored two goals. I think we had XG of at least one goal. Uh, I think we have seven shots at, uh, on goal, at goal, but only one at goal. But then Brennan came in and we kind of saw in that second half and we kind of saw the us getting into it, that rhythm that I kind of felt that we all missed in the first half. So I think uh, I think uh, it was an interesting one. Yeah. And a good game. It was. And I think they say it's that thing of we just wanted to turn up because against Fulham, yeah. I, th I think it's the first time I've actually been like, I can't watch this anymore because it's winding me up so much. But against Luton, it was like there was chances. 
it just we couldn't find the back of the net in the first half. And George, I kind of want to start. It's going to be a bit backwards for the podcast, but I know after the game and spoke about obviously there's a, a running theme that people are picking up on that in the first half we don't seem to be turning up, so to speak. Um, and Ange kind of squashed it and said there is no theme running on. I mean, do you kind of agree with Ange, or do you think it's just a weird coincidence at the moment? Um, I think. I don't think it's a coincidence. I think there's been probably too many games now where we've started off too slowly where it's just an accident that we seem to not be sort of at the gate straight away. I feel like maybe those first 10 games have set maybe some sort of precedent that we maybe shouldn't expect like a certain level at this stage under Ange. But I feel like during that beginning period of the season, we were... Pressing with a lot more of aggression, especially throughout the game, not just towards the end of the match. Um, whereas it just, for whatever reason, I think it's just, it's been quite an up and down season. Um, we've got players going in and out, whether it's injury or if they're going off to different tournaments and stuff. And I think... Can not, I add to that? Uh, go ahead, go ahead. No, because I think you're into something. I think Anne said, I, I think it said two things that I've kind of, because I was thinking about this a lot, because he, as you say, Halsey, kind of really addressed it in a kind of different way and he's in and he said similar things uh before where he kind of sees it as we have this level of intensity that we have to reach and then he kind of looks at the opponent and he expects them to tire that's why he always expects us to score late goals and expects us to be stronger than a lot of our uh, um opponents in the second half and i kind of got this vision of muhammad ali you know taking a lot of hits against the uh against the rope just waiting for the other team to tire tiring themselves out and he said something similar like he said luton came out really strong and i kind of knew that they were gonna go it was we're gonna tire so i think he sees it much more about as us not scoring our chances than us starting slow whilst my opinion have been similar to what george is saying yeah i mean that makes sense so i think yeah there's definitely something about that about the whole soaking up the pressure a bit and then sort of going at them in the second half like you, you could definitely see the loot players towards the end of the the, the the second half were absolutely gone especially in their back line and i think if it weren't for a couple of clearances from who was right back at the time uh I can't remember whoever was at the right that cleared the, a few crosses from Brennan Johnson. Um, I think if it weren't for those, it could have been a devastating scoreline for them with them being knackered. So, yeah, maybe it is about them just biding their time throughout the, throughout the match. But maybe think... we look better when other teams tired. <laughs> maybe yeah, we look true. like we're playing. The thing is, I feel like we need to. I don't know with these sort of games, it will probably come with time. But once the players are fully understanding how how to play this way, but I feel like there are just certain games like a Luton at home or if it's Burnley at home, whoever it may be. No disrespect to those teams, but we should be battering these teams now. And I feel like we, you almost need to start off really strong to really yeah. set the precedent in the match to show that look, this is a force you're coming up against. Then you can almost be a bit more strategic and throughout the rest of the first half, play it a little bit slower, soak up some pressure and then go again second half. But I think we're, we're not necessarily getting out the gates the way we should against, against certain teams. And I think that's the thing, because obviously in three minutes, Seb, we saw that Trong obviously put Luton ahead. And it kind of puts that presence again, what George and, and Simon are saying, that we don't come out the gate strong and then we tend to concede. I mean, the whole kind of play of that came from obviously Decky putting a, a ball behind Sonny. And it was just kind of a mismatch. And from there, they kind of broke, didn't they? Yeah, it kind of felt weird because it seemed it felt like a bit of a fever dream those first three minutes. Like when we conceded that goal, it almost made no sense the way that Andros Townsend, however old he is, skipping past Basuma so easily. And then just like our defenders in the box weren't picking up their men and it just seemed so easy. And it was like the worst possible start for us. I think Kulazewski's pass was obviously so poor, it put us right on the back foot. So, yeah, I was, I was quite disappointed with Basuma in, that early, in those early few minutes. And I think that set the tone for the opening 20 minutes for us where we just, we could not get going. It seemed like our players were walking through like sand or mud or something. And yeah. It wasn't great, but we actually have tended to start really well under Ange this season. I think with the new style of play, obviously the players learning it their first year doing it when we've played such kind of negative football for the last couple of years, I expect it's their bodies getting more used to it. We've picked up a lot of injuries this season. So I do think it's, you know, the, the positive signs in the first half of the season reassure me that 
heading forwards, we will we are going to start matches well on the round. It's just been a rough couple of weeks in that in that regard. Isn't that odd how our expectations have changed? Like now, <laughs> if it's not, you know, if it's not like really exciting football all the time, we get kind of <laughs> disappointed. Yeah. Like that's so fascinating. That's why I think those first 10 games have sort of ruined us a little bit because yeah. all of yeah. Andrew's previous teams, it was like they're going to really struggle at the start and then they're going to click, whereas yeah. it almost seemed to click too quick. And now yeah. we're, we're just yeah, and I'm not forever myself. I'm, I'm the same. I'm like, oh, underwhelming half. And then I look at the stats and I'm like, 70% possession, seven, seven shots of goal, two chances of. Uh, Really big chances. I mean, yeah, to score. Werner one on one pretty much, and then Sun hit yeah. both. Sun posts, hit and two then the two chances after that. It was just like yeah. And my first thought was like, ah, oh, underwhelming half, man. And just compared to where we came from, it's so I don't know. I find it fascinating how our brains kind of just uh, get used to something. And I think that's the thing. I think, and I know that I'm going to bring up certain players in a minute, like the likes of Decky and the likes of Werner for some people, that they aren't necessarily hitting the heights we want them to. But Simon, coming back to you, it's kind of that level of expectation we've kind of got. Like you are saying, with obviously you kind of forget how many goals we've created in that first half, but because they're not at the back of the net, you kind of disregard them. Yeah, I think George really put his finger on something. I think the way we started kind of warped and also, I think something good, which is our um, excitement for the future, kind of just want a lot of things to be here right now. And so it's it's easy to kind of, and, and you can see how close we are to to um, to challenge. And so we get this frustration about um, we're like children; we can see the candy through the through the window, but we can't touch it. Um, and so I think. We have that issue with a lot of our players, like how we judge players like um, Kulusevski. Like if he's not doing the thing that we need, which is right now our wing is to play in a certain way, we get really frustrated. So we don't see he him uh, delivering those two uh, brilliant passes to Werner and so on, like we talked about. We just see the mistakes. Uh, we get... We got so used to seeing Bisuma play the way it did at the start of the season. So now all we see is not him playing equally as good while still being, um, I think, solid. Uh, so that chance uh, you, you mentioned for, uh, where he didn't um, close Townsend down, I mean, I'm absolutely with you. He made a mistake, but Saar also made a mistake, and Son made a mistake, and... and a lot of stuff happened in that situation, but with me, just like you, only see Bisuma not playing to the level that he can. And so I think we, we do have this, um, we're in this odd time period where we can see where we're going, but uh, we're far away from the disaster that was last year, but not close enough for what we can be yet. So yeah, uh, sometimes it kind of, it doesn't affect the team or the reality of uh, the, the brilliant future, future of this team, but kind of distorts the uh, narratives and the discussions around it. Mm. And I think that's a great point in terms of, like you say, it's we're so hard on those players that make their mistakes. And don't get me wrong, it's so frustrating when you see that you can, you know the potential they have. And I think, George, that's why with Decky at, at points, it's so frustrating because you know how good he can be. I mean, there's that debate whether we try and fit him into the system or we play him more through the middle. I mean, that that's still up for debate as well. How do you kind of see a role for Decky in this team? Or is it just give him time, he'll do his thing? Uh, to be honest with you, I think it's quite team dependent, like our position dependent, because there's been plenty of games this season where Johnson hasn't looked good because maybe the width isn't the right thing to do. But like Decky's, he's created the most chances of any player for us throughout the season, I'm pretty sure. I think it was 43 or 45 chances so far this season. Um, and like as as Simon was saying earlier about the, the two chances for Son and, and Werner, any other day that's two assists and all of a sudden he looks good again just because he's got the goal or assist next to his name. So I think uh, maybe sometimes as fans we get a little bit too carried away with goals and assists and not actually look at what they can create against a different opposition, um, against, like against Man City, for example, Kulisewski's always played well against them. It just requires a different type of profile, different type of play. And I think Andrew addressed that. He saw that Werner was getting a lot of chances out wide um, on one side, 
but Deki kept on drifting into the middle, which wasn't working. So he just switched it up against someone else, maybe against West Ham. Having a more creative player like Kulizewski might work a lot better. It's just, it just really depends. And I think, I think eventually he said himself he wants to move a bit more, a bit more century. And I think that's fine. I think that's just naturally how he sees his game developing. But it's good for us to have someone like Johnson, or at least maybe sign players in the future if we don't, um, if we don't permanently sign Werner to sort of also play wide and, and be a different profile. So I think he, he'll fit him fine. It's just, it just depends on the game and the situation as to which player you need to opt for, really. And I definitely think, like you said, and going back to what we kind of alluded to at the start, was those subs. Because Seb, at half-time, like George alluded to, he saw that, well, I'm sure that Decky wasn't quite working on that wing. So he brought Johnson on and then it totally flipped the game on its head, didn't it? Yeah, I just think it's a case of, like George said, different different profiles suit different teams and different systems. Like Kuliseski is a player that operates really well when he can come inside and he's got the space inside to do that, like you do tend to have against Man City when we're playing more on the break. And then Brennan Johnson, when a game needs to be stretched, is good because he's more of a touchline winger, will take on his man more often as well. So I've always found with Kuliseski, there's always been a kind of, massive overreaction to him. I feel like he gets used as a scapegoat a lot in mm. our teams. He's not a traditional type of winger. He's not fast. He doesn't necessarily like to take on his man too often, but I think he's absolutely brilliant. Like George said about the chances he creates, he's so important to our team. And I do feel as though if he did have a couple of games out of our team, then I feel like the fans would be wanting him back in the team straight away again, nearly, because Johnson and Werner are quite similar profiles. But yeah, I think I love Brennan Johnson. I think I, he should start against West Ham with Timo Werner, give Kudazewski a bit of a rest and, you know, maybe bring him on in the 60 or 70 minutes, see what he can do. But, yeah, I mean, I think I actually think on the wings now we've got quite a few different profiles that I like as options. So strengthening in the summer is important as well with players like Gill going out the window. But I'm, I'm happy with both of them, to be honest. I, I think the overreaction to Kudazewski has been a bit too much. Mm, and I also, can, can I just add something? Just Can we also kind of acknowledge that Brennan has improved Poro has improved. Players that are young can improve because I definitely think he has weaknesses. He does uh, like to cut in on his left foot. I, he, we do see a lot of stuff getting missed where he could probably drive to the byline and, and, and use his right foot. But I think it can be coachable. I mean, not, we can learn not to give up on players uh, yeah. when they have something that they need to, to address. Yeah, He's 23 people... years old. I think people forget with Kulu how young he is as well. Sometimes he's still only yeah. twenty three years old. Like he's got he's got so much room to improve, and that's what's exciting about him as well. Mm. And I think it's the fact yeah. that we embedded these young players in early as well in the way that Andrew wants to play. And I think that sometimes, like we said, I don't know whether it's because we're impatient because we know where we want to head and we haven't quite got there yet, and we want to be there. Um, but I just think it's it's a great time to be a Spurs fan. Don't get me wrong; if we lost against Luton, I probably would be more negative. But we won. <laughs> Fuck <certain> cooler. Well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. But again, that got Simon. I'm going to stay with you because obviously that goal that Johnson managed to create for for Werner to fit in the back of the net kind of again highlights like we've kind of alluded to all tonight that having different people that can be different things is not a negative we shouldn't compare like Decky and Johnson together because they are two totally different players yeah I mean like the, the one thing I think Johnson has always had is this ability to to play a first touch pass like he him being quick with delivering that outside um, cross low cross what I do feel like he's really improved on is using his speed and being brave enough to go at players. Um, and yesterday I thought, I mean, it was his game. He just knew what he could do and he was uh, exposing them big ways. And I think, think, think it's important, and I think Sonny touched on this, players being on the bench and coming in, knowing that they can affect games and having that attitude of... of um, not being um, disappointing for not started, but instead seeing it as an opportunity to come in and, and change games. That's That mentality is, is something you have to add to that profile thing where, okay, this is my type of game. I can go in here and, and really change stuff. And, and um, I think Brennan is starting to show us why we pay the amount with it. I think, of course, you have to add on that tax for him being homegrown but the speed he has and his instincts and his ability to be coachable 
this quickly. I mean, if he can add a shot, like a real dependable f clinical finish, he could be, I mean, the sky is the limit. Mm. And I think that's the thing. I think it's very, I mean, all last year we were talking about competition for pay, uh, places. And I think, like you said, Johnson kind of fits that mould of he wants to prove a point if he started on the bench, but he also doesn't feel disheartened if he is. And I think that's something, like you said, Simon, that, again, a lot of us kind of forget that these players have this mentality too. And I think that's really, really important. Um, and I think we have to get used to having depth. That means player being on the bench, player coming on. We can't continue to just put players against each other. Like, Becky is good, so Brennan sucks. Brennan is good. <laughs> and, and the opposite. It has to be something where we appreciate everyone for what they can bring and and using him the right way. Hmm. I, I, I mean, exactly that. And I think, again, that's something that obviously with previous managers, they wouldn't necessarily... I kind of think it's... I wouldn't say it's not being able to manage them, but it's kind of being able to adapt. And, George, I know lots of people say that Ange has one style of playing, etc., etc., etc. But I think if you've got players that will know and how to fit in different positions. Why does it matter if we've only got one way to play, if we can do it well enough? Yeah, I mean, I think as well, if you look at Pep with Man City, look at Klopp with Liverpool, their ideology has never changed throughout the years. You've never seen Pep go to Bayern Munich and decide, well, I'm going to play defensive football now because of, for whatever reason, like he still has this attacking tiki-taka mentality or whatever. He just evolves how he does it. And then Ange is exactly the same. He's, he's, he's got the same mentality of, I want to play attacking football on the front foot, choke teams out. But his his um, tactics and I guess his formations develop over time to suit it, just depending on how the game's developing. He only started the inverted fullback stuff in, in Japan. Um, he didn't do it before with Australia and, and Co. And he, he, I was just going <laughs> to... Great! Sad. Yeah, I was, I was sad. I was just, read, just reading the book, reading a book about him. And it's just so insightful, <laughs> the fact that he, he thought that the Japanese players... Give us that knowledge. It, it was like he thought, no disrespect to Japanese, the Japanese league, but he figured that the players within the league weren't really technically good enough to be able to play long passes or long crosses well enough. So he decided, well, instead of my fullbacks trying to put crosses in that they can't do as well, let me bring them in more centrally and get them to play short passes where they excelled at. And the data showed for it. And it this sort of developed that way. So he's, he's constantly evolving the tactics, which is what a, a great manager does. But he never strays away from his football because to be the best, to be able to beat the likes of Man City while Pep is there, you have to be able to have a plan and stick to it no matter what. If you start, as we saw with Arsenal yesterday, celebrating the draw, they folded to Pep. They 27% possession. They had no shots barely throughout the game. And yet they're Two celebrating as a win. Alone, whole game. The whole game. We came out with the same result with Ben Davis and Emerson as centre-backs next to Haaland. And they weren't even missing key players. So it goes to show that sticking by his tactic works is fine it, we just need the time to sort of have the whole squad do it well throughout a whole season it's gonna come definitely. i know this has turned into me big up and this whole uh show but so <laughs> i, I kind of want to go to the fact that last year and the year before was so rough i can't fathom how people are still contemplating the fact that oh my god he's only got one way of playing oh my days it's going to end in disaster like I, I can't fathom it i don't know like how how do you kind of see it Seth? I'm I'm exactly the same as George. I think, you know, Pep and Klopp are the two best managers in the league and they have the exact same philosophy as Ange. And Ange has come out multiple times and said, you know, if you don't like it, then it doesn't matter to me because I'm going to play the way that I play it and it is not going to change. And I think the thing that people also forget is that this still isn't really an Ange Postacoglu squad that we're seeing. It's probably an Ange starting 11 now or definitely getting there. But he's only had one summer transfer window and a January window where... You know, there wasn't much activity too. Well, one centre-half and a winger. But I think next year and then going forwards, he'll have a squad where he's at, he's able to get out of those fringe players that he doesn't see as valuable to us, get in new players that add even extra value, have even more profiles in there, have more cover as well. And I think it's just going to improve and improve. I, I really see it as kind of just going like that under and just getting better and better. And I love the fact that he sticks to his principles. I love the football that he plays. And I trust it in games that it is going to work. And if it doesn't work, then that's just part of the learning journey for him. And I'm sure he'll adapt and improve from that. And also, people who say that he doesn't have a different way of playing, like he's actually shown quite a bit of flexibility this season, playing with two tens in there with Decky and with James Madison in there when we're losing. We also, he, I also noticed about him recently, there's a lot more 
Like for example, I think in the second half against Luton, Poro was overlapping a lot more than coming inside, and the doggy was bombing on a lot more. So he does definitely have different ways of playing. I'm, I'm not worried about. He even him went to a back three football. at the end of the United away match when he yeah. played Dragic's first game just to see it out. Yeah. So he knows how to adapt. Yeah. I think it's. Not, I think yeah. it's that uh, people see, like confuse adjusting and adopting. I think. He does adjust to every game tactically. Like he knows if that that winger is quick, or make sure that you play here, or he makes tactical adaptations all the time. I think this whole he doesn't adopt thing. I don't know if okay, I, I might be like a tinfoil conspiracy not here, but I feel like it's a little bit of lack of respect because people don't tell Pep or Arteta adopt you need to adopt you're being naive and if they use Pep and Arteta as comparisons I mean they've been there for seven years nine years fifth five years I mean they might change tactics or change stuff over the seasons but not in the six first months in charge right like mm -hmm. you first we need to learn what we need to forget right that's how I see. Like it also took Pep a year to learn the Man City school. That's, as well, that's what I mean. Like, it, so everyone let's, needs let's first learn this, and let's if if we'll have long term goals, let's not be afraid to to sacrifice uh, some short term things to be able to reach those long term goals. That Chelsea game is a perfect example of that. Like I don't really care what happens to this result. The 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 impact of playing this way will be much bigger if we stick to this idea. And we can see now how that game became kind of a flagpole, something we can look back at and like, okay, that's when I really knew this was real. Like the, there's no compromise to this journey. And so telling him he needs to go to back three or do this and that now in his first season seems a little bit like um, counterintuitive to me. Hmm. Uh, I just I don't know what it is. I think it's just uh, some. So I don't want to brand every every fan as uh, someone that's impatient. But it has been a long time since we have tro had trophies. But I'm telling you now, I am so glad I'm not putting up with the last two seasons again because uh, that was rough. And I will sacrifice not having that trophy for a little while longer if it meant that we we have Ange and, and the process that we keep going. But I'm going to bring it back to the to the Luton game because Simon, obviously, the man, the myth, the legend, uh, Sonny went on the score sheet once again. I mean, we praise Sonny all the time, but again, it was a great finish from him against Luton. Amazing finish. And I think he will be disappointed he didn't get at least maybe two more. <laughs> uh, extremely unlucky. I don't know about that goal line. Maybe that, that wasn't Sonny, right? That was, was that Johnson. One? That, that was Johnson. That was Johnson, yeah. Uh, but he hit the post. Mm -hmm. Twice. No? <laughs> one go. Twice, yeah. <laughs> Um, but he had that chance in the middle too, but it, it didn't hit the post, but it was a good chance. Anyways, he uh, goes to, how many goals? 200? I think I what? wrote it down <laughs> somewhere. Um, 160? 160, there you go. 160, so he's, he's reached the top four, Spurs already, uh, or is it top five? Spurs Fifth. all time. Fifth, spot. Fifth. He will reach third, I think, uh, 208 goals is third. Before he retires uh, from Spurs, I think he will become, before he retires, one of five Premier League players with more than 150 goals. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I look at him and the fact that we had him and Kane at the same time, him, Kane and Bale at the same time, and I'm like, we're so lucky that we were fans during this era. Um, yeah, just amazing. The fact that he's got this innate ability to take games on and know when it's important and to show up, and no matter if he plays on the wing or through the middle, yeah, I, I just admire him endlessly. And I think he is like, obviously, the sad times when Kane did leave. But I think he is that cornerstone uh, at Spurs at the moment in terms of the player, the, the captain. Um, uh, he just really is Tottenham. And George, it was a lovely little layoff from Johnson again. May I add, I'm singing Johnson's phrases. Um, but it, it was just a calm, cool finish, especially obviously it was the 85th, I think it was the 85th minute as well, wasn't it? Just to seal the deal. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think, look, Sonny, like you were saying, he was waiting for that goal the whole game. Should have potentially had one earlier, but he got it in the end. And I think 
I, I just love him as a captain this year. I think so many people probably questioned it at the beginning because they might have thought, does he have maybe the aggression or whatever, the, the necessary leadership in that sense. But he, he's taken on so, so well. You see, when we lose the games like the Fulham 3-0, taking on so much responsibility, saying, no, no, we didn't turn up, I didn't turn up, we need to do better. And then he, I think Sam alluded to as well, that he just takes the game by like the scruff of the neck and realises that, no, no, we're, we're going to keep fighting, we're going to keep going. The energy he has throughout the games still is is unbelievable. So um, I, I love him so much. He's, he's just an unbelievable player. So I can't say enough praises about him. I'm so happy he's at Spurs. And I, hope he's, so hard. I hope he retires here and he won't go into coaching, but I hope he goes in, like, just stays as an ambassador and is just there all the time because he's the best man. Yeah, he is. He really is. And I think, again, like like uh, Simon and George have said, Seth, when that ball, it, not one post, but the other post, you knew he was going to find that goal in the end of it. Yeah, he always does, doesn't he? I mean, I feel like I I and lots of other Spurs fans just take the level that he's at for granted. And I feel like we'll only truly appreciate it when he goes and we really feel that void in the team. But yeah, he's just, I mean, the level that he's at and the level that he performs at almost week in, week out is just ridiculous. I mean, the contribution that he actually had in the build up to his goal as well, the way he carries the ball now. I feel like his game has improved a lot this season, playing as that number nine in terms of how he plays with his back to goal. So he was never really that good with his back to goal, but now he's really contributing a lot more in the build-up centrally. And I mean, whether he plays on the left or up front, he's just absolutely ridiculous. Everybody loves him. The entire squad loves him. They love playing with him. And yeah, he's a brilliant captain, which also did quite surprise me as well. He's quite a different captain to how I thought he'd be as well. He's very vocal on the pitch. So yeah, very, very pleased with everything about him. I just love him, yeah. <laughs> it's a vibe. And I think that's the thing. I think I probably at the start of the season was thinking... Is, is Sonny going to be the right person? But clearly, uh, this is why I'm not the manager, uh, because he is just Tottenham through and through. And I think we needed someone, a player that's loved, not just on the pitch, but also off it. It is a real true testament to his He seems to, to be character. evolving his game similarly to Ronaldo as well, going from like a left wing, using a lot more of his pace and taking on ability to more of as a, just a finisher, like yeah. cold finisher as a striker as well. And I think he's, I don't know, he seems to be going along that similar sort of path. As he goes, I, I always so said, like, so I think he can play a long time because he's sure he he had that athleticism. Athlet, athleticism that's hard for a Swede. Athleticism, <laughs> athleticism, that speed. I could have said speed. Okay, <laughs> that speed uh, that you kind of felt he relied on. But now when he's getting older, he's yeah, he's got that finishing with both feet. But his movement is so smart. Like when Werner goes down that left, he doesn't sprint. He stays back into so he has space to come into when he crosses it into to Brennan. And and he does that all the time. Even when he, he runs beyond the last line, he always knows when to run, where the space is, when they're not looking. And that's all smart. I'm sure he'll be able to play striker until he's 35 plus. Um so yeah, he might retire Spurs. <laughs> yeah. I think we'd all love to see that. Um, but again, it's just it was a nice way to, to obviously finish the day off, obviously so late on as as per usual. <clears throat> but like we've all kind of mentioned, there was many opportunities for us to, to be able to be scoring more uh in that game. It's just the way it went. But I want to give a special mention, uh, and Seb, I'll come to you for this one, which is Dragon Sheen, because I, for one, I'm in love with Mickey van der Ven, but I think it was a great call for Ange to play Dragosin over uh, Mickey in this game, especially with the games that are coming up. Yeah, definitely. I thought, I mean, I've seen a lot of criticism again about him after the game at the weekend, and I've actually been really pleased with his first couple of starts for Spurs. I think he showed me kind of what I wanted to see from a centre-half coming into a team. He's so confident on the ball. He's not afraid to make mistakes, clearly. And just said that about all the players. He doesn't want them to be scared of making mistakes. And he's not. I think there is definitely some naivety in how he defends sometimes. I think against Fulham, you saw that, the way that he was losing Muniz from time to time. But that will all come with him adapting to the Premier League and adapting to his role. But... I think I'd prefer him as a backup to Romero in the future. Hopefully we get that left-sided centre-half cover sorted and then he can step into that right-sided centre-half role, which I think will suit him better. But on the ball, he's been impressive. I think in the air, he's been quite impressive and he seems confident and that's all you can ask because he's clearly got the ability and Ange trusts him. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with his, with his first three games for Spurs and obviously excited for Mickey to come back in tomorrow because I think he's definitely more suited to a game like West Ham. No, that's a great yeah. point. And then, and obviously, it was great to to 
to get the points. But like you've alluded to, Seb, next up is West Ham. So, George, I come to you. Obviously, this game is away. And as we all know, we ate West Ham. So it's a game that all these games coming into the end of the season are going to be must wins. But this one is definitely up there with the, the most one to win. Oh, I mean, this is one of the games of the season you want to win, no matter what. <laughs> Over the season has gone, it's going to be, it's going to be a tough challenge. I think. Look, I was saying this before um, when we were off air that it's one of those games. Realistically, you think we should win because, as much as it is a rivalry, we we've always been that sort of level above West Ham. Um, but it never it never ends up that way. They obviously turn up for the game. Um, since the rivalry is strong, the the fans are up for it as well. And I think. Going away from home, as much as we've we've had some wins and some losses, they, they've, the wins have not been easy. A lot of three twos, a lot of close calls, um, and I think with the likes of Bowen having an amazing season, Paqueta coming back in the team, Kudus is obviously had a good uh, debut season for West Ham as well. It's they've got a lot of good attacking players now. Whether whether Moyes decide like using that way or not, they're still shining. So it's um, with our high line, it's, it's definitely going to leave chances. And like Seb said, I think it's a perfect game for, for Van der Ven to come back into because we're desperately going to need his pace at the back. Uh, it's going to be a tough one, but we, we just have to win. We've got to keep as close to close to those top three as possible and, possible and just really, really nail our, our place in that top four. Mm. And I think that's the thing. Like we said, as much as we ate West Ham, it is a, a crucial point, three points to grab to stay up with them. But Simon, how do you kind of see this one going down for Spurs? I think, so, I mean, the obvious thing here is um, West Ham play in a way we don't like. Uh, the low block, organised, quick on the counter. Uh, they remind, remind me of Wolves that way. Um, I think what I'm thinking about a lot is I wonder how, what kind of lineup we put up. Like, I wonder if, I wonder if, he might go even more attacking to make sure that we get a quick go. Like if he puts in, um, uh, if he plays with Los Celso, or if he plays Bentancor. Uh, I mean, we have a view of Bissouma, which he doesn't seem to have because he keeps starting him, which could be more down to Bentancor coming back from injury. But we know Van der Ven is coming back. We know we'll play our usual fullbacks, Romero. Yeah, I think our focus will be on us playing our way. And what I'm going to be nervous about is if we can get a, a quick go. Because I think that will really um, change up things. Because if we get a go, they have to open up. They have to come up and play more. Uh, when It gets hard when, um, when you play low block, but you don't get anything. And they start to get confidence, you know, 20, 25 minutes in. So, yeah, I think getting a goal and seeing who we put out and if we go extra attack or if he, yeah, if he, if he gets really conservative about, you know, uh, being afraid of the counter. Yeah, stuff like that will be on my mind. And I think that's the thing. I think in terms of, like you say, getting that early goal, as we know, that's not normally in our nature, but it would be very handy against what Sam said, because like Simon says, I think that is really crucial, especially playing away and the way that they play. And obviously looking at the likes of Bowen, you're kind of thinking, we get there, get an old goal early, we could be happy days. Yeah, that's crucial. I'd, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't really concerned about the game tomorrow, <laughs> I think. <laughs> we um we really struggle as a team at the moment dealing with transitions, it, the counter attacks. They just we we can't seem to do it. And I think that's because of our lack of a dominant number six. I think it's a bit of a problem. I really worry about Lucas Paqueta tomorrow. The kind of space that he'll be picking up, and obviously had the quality that he's got on the ball is just an absolute joke. So, I mean, if I was going to give you two teams that are probably the perfect blueprint for playing against us with the squad we've got right now and the way we play it'll probably be West Ham and Wolves and obviously we've lost to Wolves twice this season so it does worry me a bit but yeah like you said I mean I'm I'm still confident I still think that we have enough to break down West Ham I still think they're quite vulnerable defensively hopefully James Madison's on it tomorrow has been slightly frustrating over the past couple of weeks but I've no doubt he'll return to that level and yeah an, an early goal is absolutely key because then that will force them to come out and play a bit more which will only benefit us so yeah definitely and I think, like you said, as we all keep saying, it's crucial against these because of the the kind of form that we've got coming up in the terms of the games and the, and the big boys that we'll be playing. But, George, obviously, I'm going to divert a little bit and just say where... There's going to be a random question now. Just to say where do you think <laughs> this season is going to kind of 
end for us? Uh, how do you kind of see it going down? Now that we've got, obviously, this last run in the games, mm. how do you see it happening, how, unfolding? It's a tough question to, to answer, to be honest, because we don't even know when half of our games are going to be played. At Come the on, moment. George, tell us. <laughs> Uh, this is tough because th these games are the ones that we should be winning. Look, we've got through Luton, which we should have done anyway. West Ham is going to be a big test. Um, but with the likes of Forest and, New and a very weak Newcastle team coming up, we have to get these wins in before that tough fixture run. Because I, I want to be as, as far ahead of United and Co as possible going into that, that last month of football. Um, I, I think it's just going to go down to the wire. V Villa, I, I thought, would tail off a lot more than they did especially being in Europe. And maybe that will be the case as the European games come up, but they're still going quite strong. I know we've got a game in hand to, to sort of level the level the, the score, but it is Chelsea away. Um, so I, I think it's just going to go down to the wire. You've, it's going to be between, between us and Villa. Man United are there and there about, but I don't think they've got the quality to come, to, to come chase us. So it's just whether we can nail that fourth spot ahead of Villa. And I think it's going to come down right to the end. Hmm. Uh, that's the thing that I think is going to stress me out the most is is that running. But Simon, for you, how how are you kind of seeing it going down? And I, I don't think it'd be a disaster if we don't get top four. No, I mean, I'm kind of boring because I kind of feel like the energy of the, the nervousness of the end of the season that I usually feel, I don't really have it. I feel pretty confident there will be five Champions League spots, but I also don't feel particularly bummed out about playing in uh, the Europa League next season. Uh, in terms of us having a chance to actually play for a trophy, that would have been a great uh, alternative. I think um, it's good development for players as well, to be yeah, honest. So, we're we're going to so, have a lot more rotation there than we would other teams. Exactly. And I feel like exactly, youth can play more. Exactly. Like, like you say, it's like the... I, I just feel like the... the the nature of this project, uh, I'm so excited and so staunchly behind and in, uh, behind Ange and uh, uh, so com convinced that it will lead to sustained success and us competing in all the competitions we want to compete in. So I'm, I'm so kind of, um, I'm not as bothered about exactly where we, or maybe I'm just in the cult and and just my god and i can't think of myself but i'm so into what he says that way like it doesn't matter if we get one trophy if it's not sustained it doesn't matter where we if we get champions league if we can't compete i'm, I'm so into that mindset so uh, i do think we go get at fourth though i do think aston villa will tail off i think we have a game in hand and uh, manchester united look crap um so I'm pretty sure we'll get Champions League and it will be a victorious, happy ending to this season. It would be, especially Angie's first yeah. one. I took uh, a long way well. around there, but, you know, I ended <laughs> like, up where you wanted to get. Good. Diversion. <laughs> <laughs> but, Sev, kind of get the last thoughts on you. Where, where do you kind of see us ending up at the end of the season? Yeah, I agree with George and Simon, I think. Um, I, I, I agree with Ange about the top four with his comments on it. It's kind of, I don't really see it as an end goal for us. Like It'd be lovely to get it and play Champions League football. Who wouldn't want to do that? But if we got the Europa League, everything kind of stays the same apart from the competition we're playing in. We're going in the same direction. Like George said, more of an opportunity for some fringe players there, probably a bit less pressure on us as well, probably, which could be nice. So there's benefits to both of them. But I do actually see us getting top four. Um, I do see us finishing above Villa. I'm quite confident of that. I think we're going to finish the season well. I actually and I mean, like, if we if we lose on that Champions League money, the, the pensioners will pay a little bit extra next year. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's awful. But uh, yeah, yeah, I see us finishing strongly, and um, yeah, getting top four hopefully. Fingers crossed. I mean, I think that's the thing. I think if you ask me at the end of last season after losing Harry Kane uh, to having a new manager and a new philosophy, I would have. Bit well, I say bitten your hand off, taking your hand off uh, for where we are right now. Because oh, we're don't forget enjoying... the, the mighty Paul Merson thought we were going to get relegated without Kane days before Very the season true. started. So <laughs> bottom <Such> half, <laughs> <laughs> utter egg man. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's been lovely to. I know we've turned this kind of show into uh, like you said, Simon, an Andrew cult this evening because it has felt <laughs> like that. But I feel like true. that every day. Like I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm honestly on Twitter, especially. I'm like, am I am I just a jest man? <laughs> I get annoyed at everyone that criticizes, but I actually feel like he 
I actually feel like um, when you see something good, you have to love it. Like you have to appreciate it. So, so I'm I'm pretty comfortable. But yeah, it's a, it's a cult like a little bit. <laughs> well, look, if, if it's winning us over, imagine what the players are like. They get to actually speak to him every day, and yeah. you, see, you see the way they believe in his football and his ideas, and yeah. the fact that Decky was copying his uh, halftime team from Sweden. <laughs> like, but they, mate, they the all... vibes right now are immaculate, and it's okay yeah. to be happy. And I, that's kind of my frustration sometimes. Like, um. I think it's fine to have criticism and discussions, but it's also okay to be happy and just, okay, we don't have a lot of things to talk about right now. <laughs> like he addressed everything and yeah, that wasn't perfect, but he, he sees it and he will do it. Um, yeah, I just feel like the vibes are so good. Like when I talk to you guys and I'm going stuff like this or speak with people online and or see people at the games and how happy they are or how, Sonny is this brilliant captain or, you know, yeah, I just feel like we're in a good place and that's okay. Agreed. And it's, it's just the fact... <laughs> even as first friends. Yeah, even... <laughs> uh, who would have thought it, eh? But no, yeah. it's, it's been lovely to dissect Luton, uh, discuss our love for Ange and obviously look for... Well, I say look forward to... Hopefully we get the job done against West Ham uh, tomorrow a bit. We'll go around the table and say our goodbyes. So, George, thanks again for joining us tonight. Where can everybody find you do your thing? Oh, thanks again for having me on. I love talking about Spurs, especially in a positive, much positive manner <laughs> than the, say after the following <laughs> game. So, no, happy to be in. Yeah, it's just Georgia Killer across all platforms, both in Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, the lot. So, yeah. Yeah. Lovely job in. No, thank you, George. And also, Seb, thank you again for coming on uh, tonight. Where can everybody find you as well? Yeah, thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed it. First time, obviously, really nice to chat Spurs in a positive way, like you guys said, much more positive than on the social medias. But yeah, just seven football on TikTok and then you can find all my other socials there. But yeah, I appreciate it. No, cheers. Thank you. And Simon as well. It's been lovely to have you on. Uh, where can I really find you too? I mean, before I talk about myself, I have to say, Halls, what an amazing host you are. <laughs> what an amazing host. The way you, you segue and you, you jump around. I'm so happy I got to see that in person. Thank you. Um, George and Seb, you're beautiful men. Uh, I <laughs> you believe too, in you. you. <laughs> uh, I'm so happy that you're part of this fan base. Uh, you find me on right there. You see my name? That we way, I think. Yeah. <laughs> that Twitter at that name. Jesus Christ, it's hard. Yeah. Um, and then there you'll see my takes and my HD8D infused spelling errors uh yeah that's all i'm sorry legend no thank you like i say thank you to everybody in the chat um appreciate everybody's uh messages and things tonight i did see some of them that did make me giggle uh but i'm as i try and navigate what's going on i'm getting worse at trying to pull things up so appreciate you all chatting in uh like i said uh we play tomorrow so fingers crossed we win uh, on Wednesday, I'll be joined by Wes for the Hotspur Huddle Well, we will set that West Ham game and look ahead to the game at Forest. My word, they're coming in thick and fast. Uh, and then because we obviously play on Sunday now, uh, we will have all these Hotspurs next Monday. So make sure you subscribe and all the good stuff so you don't miss that. And make sure you go follow these guys as well. Um, and until next so time... So you're doing two shows this week? Yeah, man, it's, it's pretty oh rough. Oh, my God, big week. <laughs> <laughs> it's I good times to be one. hard. Whoa. Yeah, it's too much, man. Yeah. I mean, I say Easter, so I've done nothing over Easter, so I can prepare myself. Um, but no, I appreciate <laughs> you all, guys. Uh, until next time, I'll use Spurs.